Appreciate you being with us this afternoon. Um, as Suzanne said, my name is Smith Patalo. I'm the curator of contemporary art here, and I had the great honor of bringing this exhibition to the Courier and to you all. And um, we're really excited, as Suzanne mentioned, that we'll also be publishing a catalog. So you can check in with our um, store on your way out, or just keep looking for updates. But that'll come out later this summer. We're very excited about that as well. Um, so. Today we're going to talk a bit about the exhibition itself, but more to give a background on Arman and her work, and for her to kind of walk us through her inspirations um, and her working methods and how she got where she was today. Um, I've been remarking to most folks that I have been speaking to that as a, as a painter, kind of professionally and in this media, Arman hasn't been working for that long, uh, you know, in relation to uh, her career so far. So. The work upstairs, for those of you who've seen it, is, is mind-blowing in that sense that she's so um, technically accomplished. So, um, As I said, the um, exhibition is the first uh, kind of retrospective of, again, that short time that Arman has been working. It includes 23 objects um, made in the last three years from different series. Um, and we'll all be upstairs uh, talking about it with each other, I'm sure, afterwards. I'm showing a few slides here to uh, give you a sense. So, um, Herman, I'd like to start, um, if you can tell folks about, you know, how you got started um, in art making, your kind of, your journey towards painting, and I have some early work up on the screen that we can also talk about. Um, first of all, thank you for all uh, coming to this talk, and it's an honor to have my show at this beautiful museum. Um, so, I mean, I, like, I think like every other artist at a very early age, I, I was very drawn into drawing and um, mark making and uh, my parents were very supportive of everything I did and my father is an architect uh, specialized in traditional Islamic architecture, so at those early ages I was exposed to all these like patterns and designs, um, but later on uh, when I was older and I had to decide what to study in college, still at that age I was thinking that art is something, it's leisure, it's something that I should pursue on the side and it's not something that I can um, rely on as a stable profession and I thought I should become an engineer. So um, in high school in Iran we have to decide these majors like math, biology, human, uh, liberal arts and um, art, visual art, and at that point I decided to study math. But at last year of um, high school I thought that, I mean, I would leave only once, so maybe I should pursue what I love. And still I thought that I should find a profession which is more practical, so I uh, studied graphic design in college, and, um, and later earned a, a master's in illustration, and for like 10 years, I was a graphic designer and like commercial graphic design, like logo design, package design, things like that. And I, like on the side, I was doing some painting, but not really seriously. And in 2015, um, <coughs> it was the first time that I decided to pursue painting. It was for me like an ambition, like the high shelf. Um, so I decided to come to the States um, to, to pursue painting and after a year at Brandeis um, I uh, got admitted to RISD painting program and um, since these three years my work dramatically like, evolved and changed. So this is one of the examples of the works I made uh, in grad, grad school that for me was a turning point and after that I had a more clear idea of what I want to talk about in my paintings and I could um, develop a creative process. So these works were all based on found images of tile patterns or um, like the two examples on the left or um, that was the Quran cover. So I um, just the patterns and the f like the floral illustration. So I silk screen printed those and used that as the starting point for my painting. Um, and I painted the figures on top of that existing image. And for me, it was um, representing the duality that we experienced in Iran, like the private space and public space, these two different lives that we have to 
uh, and we can later talk about it. Yeah, I don't want to. Um, uh, yeah, so that was that was where for me in the studio things started to to evolve. And it's interesting, and um, we'll talk about more, especially with the work in the exhibition, that there's these um, material, literal material connections to to your family and to your home in Iran. And so here, kind of riffing off of these tile patterns, which as you said was something that your father was working with as an architect, working in traditional Islamic architecture. Um, and later, as we'll see, working on textiles that are very, are, were from, are from Iran and, and are woven into the work. Um, and so it's great to see this as a start. Um, and then you moved on uh, to another kind of series and extension of that. Can you talk a little bit about the next couple of works? Um, yeah, so after those series, my, I was very interested in this idea of starting each painting from a found image rather than a blank page. Um, and I was thinking about what can be the other options to, to pick as the starting point. And at that time, I had um, traveled home for like two weeks. And when I got back to the States, a week after, um, uh, Trump signed the so-called Muslim ban that um, prevented um, entering citizens of six Muslim majority countries to the states, and Iran was one of them. So if like a week I had stayed in Iran a week more, I couldn't come back to school and finish my program. So uh, my first reaction to the whole incident was anger, and I decided to react to that anger in my studio. And I had two uh, expired passports with me the last time I visited home and I thought that I can paint on pages of my passport. So that's the passport, um, those, like you can see the numbers and other, uh, yeah, other information on the passport. So I started painting on, um, literally painting on my passport pages and then designed a box so that to to add another layer to the piece, not just materially, but meaning-wise, like those face recognition rectangles. Uh, and also it gave more... So I wanted to treat my passport as a symbol of my nationality, as an, a precious object by this. Um, and I was really interested in this idea. Um, and I was very fascinated by the small scale of it and how it it resembles Persian miniature painting because that's one of my main sources of inspiration. Um, and later on, I decided to scan pages of my current passport. This is the blank page with, and the current passport had a new design. So if each two page had an individual design based on a historic site, so it had a lot of potential. So I could place my figures uh, in those um, historic buildings. And the more I started working on this series, um, the, my mind was occupied less about that, the starting point, which was the Muslim ban. And now that I knew I cannot travel home for at least several times, um, I started to think about my memories from Iran. And beyond getting nostalgic, um, I started to think about my life experiences in Iran. So th those. Uh, memories became the, the main subject matter, which until today I'm exploring again, uh, which is the more focus is around the, um, the human right issues in Iran and mostly women uh, that we can talk about later <coughs> in those works. Um, yeah, and so the work started uh, more, you know, paper-based, and but all of that res response to found objects and the interest in design and as, as I said before, kind of the tile design and things that are referencing specific materials or motifs that are kind of inherent, you know, to your culture, to Iranian visual culture. Um, so that's sort of a constant through the work. And then you started working a little bit larger and more in kind of a scale um, of painting. So kind of works like these, if you want to talk about how you started working with fabrics and where the imagery came from. Yeah. So. Uh, up to that point, as you mentioned, all my works were on paper, but I was interested in trying different materials so I can, because um, paper you, is not that, you cannot use different acrylic mediums or different 
create different textures with it. So, and I was still interested in the idea of having an existing image as the starting for each work. So I came up with the idea of uh, using these textiles as my canvas. And at the beginning, I um, uh, started um, appropriating textiles that I found here, but I uh, was more interested in those designs that had some similarities with my visual memory and my culture. For example, these two examples, um, and um, and and you can see that still my like in terms of subject matter, my mind is still. Um, I'm th I'm still thinking about Iran and um, the situation about women, um, and after these theories, I was more interested into. Um, pick a textile which is more culturally specific to my own culture so that it's already culturally loaded. Um, so I asked my father to send me some textiles from Iran that are traditionally made and you can see later two examples uh, in the exhibition at, uh, at the museum. And this is another example of the textiles I found here. And um, so these patterns are from the textile. I just painted the, the shadows and highlights um, to, to create this illusion of uh, like three-dimensionality, but the belt is an actual 3D object. So it's one of the examples of using found objects uh, in these works. And this is a work that's in the exhibition, so folks will be able to go see that um, upstairs. Um, and in terms of found objects, this is this is an earlier work this, that's not an exhibition, but to talk about, begin to talk about some of the other historical and art historical references that you are bringing into the work. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, because for me the whole, one of the main ideas behind my practice is this idea of contradiction, which is reflecting on the contradictions I face in Iran, this, constant battle between modern, modern ideas and um, traditional ideas and so on. And for me, one of the ways to visually um, uh, um, like express those ideas is to um, juxtapose imagery from contrasting context. In this case, for example, um, I, I appropriated the figure in this um, Piero della Francesca painting for, as the main figure in my work. And I used um, a, found, a found textile that you can see on the left, which was actually a prayer's mat. So I was um, praying mat. So I was interested in juxtaposing imagery that are coming from uh, a Western context and Christian context, and with um, imagery like the, the prayer mat coming from uh, an Eastern context. And also, this, this contradiction can be between, also between. In, in terms of time, between something that is coming from a more um, historic context and something that is more contemporary. For example, the, these neon lights is something that we associate with modern era. Um, um, yeah. And then this work, which um, is in the exhibition, has uh, a similar type of textile um, in it. Um, do you want to talk about when you started working with, with these textiles and where they came from and, and how they informed the work? Yeah, these are the, the textiles that earlier I mentioned that I asked my father to send them to me. These are all, um, so the upper part, I combined it with um, cotton canvas on the bottom. Um, these are all wood block, hand wood block printed and they're um, they have, I mean, these are made traditionally in Iran for, for centuries. centuries. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, I was interested in the idea to um, use the color palette or the composition that these textiles suggested, and I intentionally asked my father to he so that he decides which pieces to send. Um, and I have no say in which color or which uh, scale, so it was an interesting challenge to have. Um, and for the and this is one of the examples that I appropriated imagery from Persian miniature paintings. Um, both the fire, which is something you often see in uh, in those works to depict a holy person, but in this 
this piece I um, I try to to subvert that that um, um, that metaphor behind these fires that you often see in miniature paintings, and here it has more of a negative connotation with the gas um, the gas mask uh, in front of that. Um, and and again in this piece you can I mean if you you look at it in person, I've used uh, one of the other um, found objects beside the textile is the um, the red lines that are leather cords. So these are actual. Uh, chords and I like to have this play of having a uh, paint. So some parts, for example, the one on the branch is painted, but the rest is is the actual chord. I like to juxtapose these uh, like a 2D painted image and a 3D object side by side. Uh, so hopefully it invites the audience to look closer to the piece and try to figure out which part is which. Yeah. Um, and Speaking, I think, and I apologize, we're going back and forth between letting it run and pausing it, so I keep going back and forth on these images, but um, to kind of ground the audience in this reference to Persian miniature paintings, which you've um, mentioned a couple times now, we have just a few examples here, and then we'll talk about some of the works that reference these um, specifically, but do you want to talk about what drew you to Persian, obviously Persian miniature paintings are, you know, from, from your culture, they're part of your cultural heritage, um, but what what draws you to these, um, this kind of stylized look, which in, in this the audience can see, and for folks who maybe aren't familiar with Persian miniature painting, these are um, illustrations akin to like a medieval manuscript, so they'd be parts of books, usually illustrating a, a poem or a history, um, and they have this very, they're very rich, saturated in color, um, they're minute, obviously, so they're very um, finely detailed, um, and then the space is always quite um, flattened in terms of the perspective, and so your narratives are kind of stacked um, one upon the other. Um, but there's like, some specific things that draw you to it. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about, about that kind of through these examples. Yeah, as, as uh, Sam mentioned to these works, we're always uh, painted to be part of a book so, book. so there was always two two frames that the artist had to work with, one was the page and then the other frame that they drew uh, for the paintings and so there was this margin. But there were some examples in those works that the artist decided to have some elements like here, the, some parts of the architectural elements or the landscape or the figure growing out of that rectangle. Um, I, I was really fascinated with this idea and I was thinking of a way to translate that in my own work. So that was when I came up with this uh, idea of making shaped panels that you can see one of the examples, more than one, yeah, at, the, at this exhibition. So that was uh, the Persian miniature painting that um, I was inspired by and used as the starting point for my painting and built this shaped panel based on the forms that the, um, the architectural geometry that it suggests. Um, and then when I started working on shaped panels, um, when I no longer was working on a regular rectangle, the work became more as an object itself rather than a flat painted surface, which that led me to my next works that are more three-dimensional and have more depth. This is again another example of shaped panel. With This one was also based on a Persian miniature painting and uh, in this work I was also exploring different different materials. Um, so the gray area on yeah the gray area is actually cement that I um, applied on the canvas and I was interested in juxtaposing this cement with the painted areas. And again for me it was another way of exploring contradiction this time in terms of the material and texture, cement is, have, has a rough mm, texture, neutral in color, and then the painted parts are more delicately painted and um, uh, vivid, more vivid colors. And uh, so I like this, like this contrast that it had. Um, and this, and these um, past two works and, and the rest of the works, we're kind of just going to let it run behind us as we talk about. Um, 
kind of some more elements are all, all things that will be seen in the exhibition. Um, and so, so what you see in, in, in the progression, again, as I said, in just this short time is the expansion of this idea of dimensionality. And what that does is really bring the work out into the space of the viewer. And so you have this inspiration from this very flat perspective. Um, and what you're doing is, is kind of bringing the viewer into that world. But then the world itself is your own world. <laughs> it's, very, it's very much a, I think of it as like a, a dream world or kind of a fleeting um, image in the imagination because everything is very much contained to this very pointed narrative um, where there's uh, a condensed um, image uh, or scene. Um, but one of the constants in the work that's in almost all of the works, all but one work in the exhibition actually, is the appearance of a, a woman, of a, of a figure of woman or parts of a figure of woman. Can you talk about that part of your practice and why she is the central protagonist in your work? Yeah. As I said, I'm reflecting on my memories and life experiences from Iran, but I don't want it to be limited to my own memories, so I'm looking at it in a broader sense, and I want to to, sh to, to reflect on stories of so many different, several women from my own generation who have gone through the same things, uh, mostly after the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, which turned the country into, into a, a theocracy. Um, using religion as a tool to, to control people. And in this situation, this, for, for women, everything is more um, harsh. Um, and that's why most of the, the characters, most of the figures in my work are female characters. And the other, um, for me, it was also interesting because I'm appropriating in most of my work Persian miniature paintings. And in those paintings, um, women mostly have the secondary role, and um, male male figures are have the main roles. And in each scene and in each story, mostly there are some examples that is the opposite. So I was interested in subverting that um, that idea and uh, placing um, women's like this. In this case, uh, it was based on a miniature painting. The back, the two rectangles on the back. So then I wanted to give more presence to the women uh, in these works um, and also they're in confined situations that are not quite comfortable, they, they cannot move very freely but I, I, at the same time I wanted to give them, um, to show them that they are in charge or they have power, um, ironically. Uh, and um, yeah, and in this work you can see um, Another example of using found objects like the, the, the blade for the saw, which is cutting the trees, an actual um, blade. Um, yeah. And then one of the other kind of things that we're seeing in this work, this one, this one, um, maybe we'll pause on this one, are these, there's a lot of um, lines in the work. And that cut the work in different ways. And so sometimes they're literal cords, red cords, black cords, um, ratchet straps, and the last um, piece. Um, and sometimes there are lines that you're, you yourself are creating compositionally as an artist, so really harshly, you know, cropping figures, extreme cropping, choosing facial features of the woman to show or not show, and sort of confining them within the canvas and within the um, uh, composition itself. Um, can you talk about, um, through, through this piece and, and you know, the other set folks have seen and we'll see upstairs, where that decision to use this chord kind of came from and how it's evolved in, in the work? Yeah, in earlier works prior to this, um, I had this recurring element of uh, red lines. And uh, for me, the thought process behind it was that I was thinking about the situation in Iran and how there are a lot of lines drawn by the, by the, by the uh, political system on us, 
that mustn't be overpassed. So I thought that I can literally paint these red lines as a symbol of that. Um, and in more three-dimensional works, I decided to use actual chords so they had three-dimensionality. And later on, I, um, I started using this sim symbolism of um, shackle, ball, and chain as this, an obvious um, um, symbol of lacking freedom. And um, eventually, I simplified that the image of the chain and um, used these black lines instead. Uh, but still, I had this like the, the shackle and the ball, so that there was a point of reference. Mm -hmm. And in some works, I eliminated those two, and we can only see um, see the black lines. So for me, the black lines are um, a symbol of, uh, as you can see here on her mouth, um, a symbol of restriction or um, confinement. But as you said, um, the women in the work. Their facial expressions, their postures don't match what one would expect given the confines of the environment that they're um, within. You know, in this case, there's this push pull between the beauty of the work, of the, the painting in the background, the color of the figure itself, the kind of um, luminosity of the woman's skin, her face, you know, against what's being, you know, pulled through her, but it's also, you know, I see it as like being worn defiantly as like jewelry of, of oppression almost, just like taking on this feminine burden almost. Um, can you talk uh, a little bit about your use of um, color and something like this one or, or this one um, before it, you started as folks probably have seen in this progression, that there's changing of tones also throughout the work as you've switched from, or not switched, but you know, moved from textiles to these larger um, works. So kind of what the shift to, to neon was. Yeah. So as um, so those textile was works for me. Um, the the textile mm, the pattern and that color palette for me suggested the color, and those are more healthy tones and. Uh, not as vivid as these newer works. Um, I, and I wanted to explore more and more this idea of contradiction, not just in terms of the imagery that I use, uh, which we saw some examples, but also the material I use and how visually the, 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 the piece looks. So I, I was interested in using these very vivid colors, um, fluorescent colors that are both uh, associated with like something playful, pleasure, uh, and also neon colors um, such as the contemporary time. We don't have examples of these colors in historic, in our his, in historic imagery. Uh, so that was for me the, the, the point of, um, like the starting point to use these. And also the contrast uh, these vivid colors had with these like positive, um, playful connotations with the the underlying meanings and um, situations that the, each painting suggests. So I, I again I like that contrast and I think that it creates some sort of tension juxtaposing these two at the same time. And also this this contrast um, is also in the way the women are posed. So as you mentioned, they're in a in a pose that doesn't seem to, so they don't look like that. There's something unpleasant happening around them or to them. Uh, so they're they have a neutral. Those that you can see the face, there's a neutral feeling to their um, to their face and body gesture. And again, for me, it was another way of uh, exploring this idea of contradiction. Right. And so there's a lot. Um, I think the work is sort of hard to describe to folks without showing them an image because there's an impulse to say that there's an element of surrealism to it, which of course there is. It's very much within the lineage of surrealism. Um, there's an element of magic realism, that sort of more American art movement of um, these scenes that are, are completely you know, banal and realistic otherwise, but this has this one magical element in them. Um, but because they're so, they're both so removed from an environment, and still specific to our time, you know, these women feel like they're they're us, they're among us, but they're in these spaces that aren't quite 
before us or current us or future from us, um, it, it, it kind of um, puts you in this, in this weird viewing space where you're relating to the figure and kind of empathizing with the figure and the figure situation, but you also kind of don't really understand you know, what's going on. Um, or, you know, moments like this where you're really um, concentrating the, the scene um, of the figure. Um, in terms of materials, can you talk about the shift that happened, the necessary shift that happened in your materials um, in March 2020? Yeah, so this is one of the first works I made during the lockdown. So I didn't have access to my studio and I mean, when we knew that there was a lockdown, I could grab some of my painting material and set up my studio in our living room. And I usually build my own panels. I didn't have access to the wood shop that I you know, used to work in. And I really didn't like this idea that this situation is preventing me from painting. So I was exploring in our apartment to find what I can paint on. So I, um, I found, picked this, it was an old book. I picked this as my canvas and painted on it. And later that I had access to the woodshop, I could build my own panels, but still I had a limited space. And I really didn't like this idea that the situation is dictating the scale of my work. And I wanted to even make the largest works I've ever made in this situation. So I came up with this idea of combining several smaller panels um, for to create one piece so I could work on each panel at a time and eventually they could all be assembled to make a larger piece and um, that gave me this idea of playing with more three-dimensionality three because now that I have several panels I could have different depths for each panel so I could create some space and the works became more sculptural. There are two, exam two examples in um, that you can see at the gallery um, and then I that led me to use more cutout, wood cutouts to create more um, sculptural works. Um, yeah, that was how the work evolved. And then there's also a play, I think it's interesting when, when you're in the show is that our home's work, um, some of it will set you up in an expectation of what the next one might be like in terms of how it was made or, or found objects or something like that. So. You know, work like this, for example. Um, do you want to talk about the, the the suitcase? The intent behind that is found object, and then we can um, talk more about the scene and what's going on. Yeah, this is again another works I made during lockdown, um, and in this this piece, I was thinking about because uh, this idea of using multiple panels for me had not just because of those logistical issues. It had another metaphoric meaning because of these like multiple spaces to work with. As an immigrant I feel like that I'm living in these multiple spaces. I'm from Iran but I no longer live there and I now I'm living here but I don't quite feel that I took a hundred percent belong here so I'm living in this in between places uh, like a third space in between both. So um, this piece is um, one of the works that is more focused on the concept of immigration and suitcase um, suggests that. And uh, for the imagery inside the suitcase, I appropriated an, a miniature painting. In my works, um, whenever I have this um, imagery of like landscape, trees, flowers, blossoms, uh, I'm thinking about an ideal space um, something that in most religions or um, um, in uh, literature, for example, heaven is depicted as, as a garden. And then on the contrast, when I, um, so when the, the trees, for example, like this one is, is not uh, green and um, is in decay, I'm suggesting the other, otherwise. And I'm thinking about my home country, which once was, was a blossoming tree, and now this is how I feel at the moment. And the birds are another um, recurring element that for me um, suggest not just immigration but freedom. They can pass boundaries without 
having to get visas, <laughs> um, and they, yeah, they have this freedom of movement unless they're trapped by human beings. Um, so that's another symbology, and here you can see also the red line symbol. Uh, and I intentionally I didn't want to to show the face uh, the the face of the, the character, so it doesn't refers to an individual person and it's more, it suggests a broader um, group of people, not just um, one individual person. And it's again that, um, the tricking of the eye in terms of the object itself, where even I, through a PDF, or through an image, so I saw it in person, um, and, and what you're seeing here at the left is the image straight on, and then kind of as you move around it, and some details, or the work itself, sorry, rather. Um, from the front, and as you're approaching it, it, it appears as if you're looking into, you know, a suitcase that's been, you know, painted inside of. And then when you get closer, what you realize, what you're seeing is a solid piece of wood that the artist has painted to look as if you're looking in the space. Um, and then applying those, you know, found handles and, and locks to it, to then, again, kind of, Cool with your, your mind as you're looking at it, especially if you've maybe just seen the one with a real book on it, and so you expect it to be a real object. Um, so there's a lot of different um, aspects of play in the work, which is, uh, again, another contradiction between what you're looking at in terms of subject matter and the symbolism that uh, you are seeing and the sense of restriction and being confined, um, and then having these kind of witty turns um, in in these juxtapositions of subject matter in the way that the artist is dealing with the materials. Um, and I don't know, I'm speaking about like you're not here, the artist, like are not dealing with materials. <laughs> I've been giving a lot of tours last few days. Um, so, uh, so I think that that's something interesting uh, that folks will see kind of as, as they explore it. Um, I want to come back to this work to, to note uh, kind of one other thing that people are seeing in so much they're not seeing, um, going back to this element of, of women being, you know, central, really a woman or a bird as a stand-in for, for an immigrant are essential to all works. Um, but there are few instances where, where men are in, shown in the works. Um, this example, um, even Adam, there is a uh, masculine figure, but the feminine um, figure. Can you talk a bit about this work and also the choice to include um, the figures of men when you do? So this work is based on a miniature painting. Uh, and so these like rectangles that they were depicting a, a garden and the negative space in between them was like river. Um, that I, I decided based on that composition to make this work. And this, this um, imagery of garden reminded me of Garden of Hidden and then I decided to, to paint my own version of, um, and a contemporary version of course with the clothes and other elements. Um, and there, are, I don't, usually I don't include a male figure in my work um, and whenever I use it's more in a one-to-one -one relation and there are some other examples that you can see in the show uh, that there are like a group of female, male characters that have a smaller presence in gen yeah, like this one. Um, and in, uh, in that piece, Adam and Eve, again, it was one of the other works that I explored different materials uh, and I used cement. And like this work, in Eve and Adam, I was interested in juxtaposing the, the neutral rough image of uh, like texture of the cement besides these um, painted panels that are more precisely painted and um, the colors are um, more mm, playful. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I would like to um, leave the rest of what's going on to the viewer yeah. to figure out. <laughs> um. So I'll just let it run, and then there's one more piece I wanted to ask about, and then um, it'll be time for our questions. Um, that comment that you made about the leaving uh, space for the viewer, because as uh, has been made clear in our conversation, the starting point for you is very personal. It comes from your memories and feelings and 
gathering these images as you're constantly looking at, at art, um, things like that, and, and then uh, using this sort of pastiche to put them together as collage. Um, and what is, I guess, why is it important for you because some artists would make, like, this is the work, this is the this is exactly what it means, and this is, I want you to know all the things about it. Um, but in, in your case, um, you want it to be left a lot more open. So why is that important to you? Yeah, because as you mentioned, I like, I mean, of, of course, the starting point for me, the point of departure is my own um, memories, my own um, um, life experiences. And I have a more specific uh, concept behind these paintings, but I want to have a more symbolic approach, so it suggests a wider uh, concept. So um, viewers that are coming from different backgrounds, different walks of life, they can also relate to the paintings. Although I'm talking about like the situation of women in Iran, but maybe a woman has experienced, for example, domestic violence, or someone else has experienced um, mental illness or these things, so they can also associate, they, they can also find some some moments in these pieces that can speak to them uh, based on their experience and hopefully it's something more universal rather than something personal uh, or something very culturally specific. I want to, um, to start a dialogue uh, with a broader audience. Um, and so that timed out perfectly. So I wanted to um, talk a bit or end on this work um, because from that statement of most of the work coming from memories, coming from these more kind of abstract places, um, to talk about this one work which in our discussions was one that you noted was specific to uh, a feeling that you have in, in this moment and in the last couple of years that is more universal. So can you tell us a, a bit about this work and how it came together and, and what it means to you? Yeah, so um, this is one of the last pieces I made during lockdown. And um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was, I had, I freaked out. And I was, I didn't ex exit our house for like three months, even not just going for a walk. And I, it, it was really a feeling of suffocation for me. And I was browsing these ancient miniature paintings and I came up with, with, with an illustration that had this figure of the, the dragon and for me um, it's like it, it's facial expression for me it, remind, it for me it was like shouting and I thought if I juxtapose it with uh, the image of the woman um, face and place the dragon where the face is supposed to be it's your eye reads it as a continuation of that that face, so at that, as if the, the woman is shouting, which was how I felt, <laughs> um, not literally, but uh, emotionally. Uh, and then like this, this um, phantom-like um, image of the gas mask, that is something like this, for me, was a, a symbolism of that, that feeling of suffocation. And then like the, the, the tree and the blossoms suggest like a better time, hopefully when things are back to normal. So that's yeah, that's that was the idea behind this piece. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for all of your answers, and um, that's I think a place that we're gonna end it. And we will obviously invite people to look. We've only talked specifically about a few of the works in the exhibition um, on purpose to sort of pique your interest. Um, so I think we'll take questions. So thank you, everyone.